Hello and welcome. You're watching to the point. 40 days after demonetization, is it likely to be successful or a failure in tackling black money? What is its impact on the economy? Is it feasible and practical to believe that India can soon transform into a cashless and digital economy? And as a result of demonetization, do we now need to delay the rollout of GST? Those are some of the key issues I shall raise today with former Finance Minister P. Chizamram. Mr. Chizamram, let's start with the most recent developments. On Friday, the Revenue Secretary announced a new amnesty scheme for black money, which will continue till the 31st of March. At the same time, he's also announced a new email ID, which is available to whistleblowers who want to report on other people's black money to the government. Forty days after demonetization, which was supposed to tackle black money, how do you respond and what do you make of these two new developments? Well, it's a tacit admission by the government that demonetization has no direct impact on either generation of black money or use of black money. This is what I said even on the first day, 9th of November, the day after demonetization. So they're finding other conventional ways to deal with black money. They're using conventional measures. We had VDIS in 1997. They had IDS earlier this year. They're announcing a second amnesty scheme. They are relying on whistleblowers. Well, all that is perfectly understandable, but I'm glad they have tacitly admitted the demonetization has no direct effect on black money. Now, in fact, the email ID, to put it bluntly, is actually going to encourage or facilitate people sneaking and snooping on each other. It is even possibly a way of enabling people to carry out vendettas against those they don't like or those they have some grievance with. In a democracy, is that acceptable or is it unfortunate, possibly even undesirable? Well, I don't think the email makes it easier or uh, more difficult. You could have sent it by post. Uh, therefore, email is only a mode of communication. The finance ministry, the CBDT, always receives a large number of representations by post, usually anonymous, but sometimes uh, pseudonymous. But it doesn't solicit them. In this case, the government is specifically soliciting them. Well. Uh, government makes it clear that it will look into complaints but just as the postal complaints many of them were either frivolous or vengeful or uh, uh, completely baseless you will find that many of the emailed complaints are also baseless or vengeful so these will be a a problem for the system to handle and b they could lead to harassment of innocent people they always do Anonymous complaints lead to harassment of people. Uh, they always do. So I don't think this makes the position worse, but it simply gives it a te technical gloss. Uh, people were sending it by post, they will send it by email today. Now, both these developments have happened after first the Revenue Secretary and then the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog virtually suggested that practically all of the 15.4 lakh crore that had been demonetized on November the 8th would come back into the system by December the 30th. Do you think the two events are linked or is the chronology just coincidental? They are linked if they had come in through the banking system there won't be any additional tax revenue to the government unless of course further investigation of deposits revealed tax evasion. So by opening a parallel window, it's a parallel window, they are saying, all right, if you don't want to put it in the bank, uh, give it to us by way of a deposit today and we'll charge you 50% tax. I think people will simply weigh the options and decide which is more cost effective for them to pay 50% tax or to go through the deposit route. Now analysts say that if virtually all the 15.4 lakhs comes back by the 30th of December, only two conclusions are possible. Either there was no black money, or more likely, it's been comprehensively laundered. Would you agree, or do you think there's a possibility of a third interpretation? You no, know, there's no third interpretation, and I don't accept the first either. There was obviously a portion of that was black money. Black money means tax avoided or tax evaded income. So it's been laundered? Obviously. I mean, 
I thought uh, magazines, newspapers are uh, listing ways of laundering. In fact, <laughs> I won't be surprised if there's a do-it-yourself pamphlet on how to launder money. But the government says that in fact there's a, perhaps a fairly sizable element of what is called double counting. The Economic Affairs Secretary has specifically made this point and banks have been asked to double check. But today, speaking to the Hindu, Usha Thorat, a former yes. Deputy Governor, has said, and I think I'm quoting her correctly, there is no question yes. of double counting. In this instance, who do you go with, Usha Thorat no, or the yeah. Economic Affairs Secretary? U U Mrs. Usha Thorat is right. What they are counting is only what actually comes into the currency chest of the RBI. So there can't be any double counting. Whether it came through one bank, whether it came through two banks, whether it came through the post office, no counting takes place at that stage. The RBI is only counting what actually landed in its currency chest, where that note is finally impounded. It doesn't go back to circulation. So the government's suggestion that there could be double counting, leave aside the sizable amount of double counting, is possibly an attempt to get out of the embarrassment of the fact that virtually all the 15.4 that they've demonetized well, will come back. That is, of course, an unkind interpretation. They perhaps genuinely thought that uh, banks without currency chess may be counting it once and the other bank may be counting it a second time, post offices may be counting it once and other banks count it a second time. It's possible that they uh, didn't understand how the system works but now that a former deputy governor has made it clear uh, the, the RBI is counting only what actually landed in its currency chest. So there's, that's no, final. So there's no hope of double counting full no, stop? I don't think so. Now the government says even if all the 15.4 lakh crore comes back into the system, they will A, scrutinize all large accounts, B, they say they will identify black money deposits, and C, they will tax and charge penalty. And separately, Surjit Bhalla has said that at the end of this process, in the first year, the government could earn 2.5 lakh crore, and thereafter, 1.5 lakh crore every year in perpetuity. If that turns out to be the case, the government will have earned huge revenues but do you believe it will turn out to be the case? It's highly exaggerated. Uh, Mr. Surjit Balla has been the most, uh, I mean, the loudest uh, drum beater for demonetization. He's uh, completely uh, isolated in this debate. If the 15 lakh 44,000 crore comes back, as I said, it is. Koda Pahad Nikli Chukya. Why did you do this exercise? Because you could have achieved the same result as Dr. Bimal Jalan said without putting the people through such long pain. Part of it, yes, will be investigatable. Large deposits, unusual deposits will be investigated. And it's possible that uh, some taxes will be collected at the end of the investigation. But as a former chairman of the CBDT pointed out, if there are 45 crore bank accounts in which deposits have been made, and if you take even 1% of those accounts for scrutiny, that is 45 lakh accounts, and you have to complete the scrutiny within two years, there is simply no machinery to scrutinize 45 lakh accounts. Where is the machinery to scrutinize a deposit in 30 or 40 crore Jandan accounts. Where is the machinery to scrutinize it in the non-Jandan bank accounts? I think without understanding the enormity of the task, people are glibly talking about scrutinizing every deposit. Which means that any hope the government has of scrutinizing accounts, detecting black money and then taxing and charging penalty is a very small, slim, slender hope at best, if that even. Oh, they will scrutinize some accounts where there are very large deposits. But that's it. But then, if somebody who's made that large deposit, do you think he would have made without um, assessing the chances of his explaining it satisfactorily? <laughs> Therefore, he's not a fool either. Which means that money that's been laundered will have been laundered in small accounts to avoid detection, and those people will effectively get away with it. Well, see, every small deposit is not laundered money. Sure, that I accept. Middle class today has money at home. 
lower middle class has money at home. Farmers have money at home. And if they are putting in, I was talking to a cooperative central bank, and there was such a hue and cry about it. I was told that the average deposit, average, in all the accounts is only 20,000 rupees, the additional average deposit. Now that is, yeah, some of it, obviously more than 20,000, some less than 20,000, some of it may be laundered. But to suggest that every deposit of 20,000 by a farmer is laundering money is, I think, being completely unfair to the farmers. People will have money at home. In which case, let me conclude this part of the interview by asking you a simple question. In terms of tackling black money, do you think demonetization has been partly successful, totally unsuccessful, or by any chance do you think by some miracle it could end up actually being a complete failure? Mostly. Mostly unsuccessful. Mostly unsuccessful. Yes. Because demonetization, as I started by saying, has no effect on black money. When the new currency comes, is it anyone's case that black money will not be generated in new currency? What is black money? If I pull out money from my company, if I pull out money from my income and don't disclose it in order to meet a demand for unaccounted payment, I'm generating black money. There's a demand, there is a supply. Today it has happened in old currency. Tomorrow it will happen in new currency. Except that the new currency must come to the market. As the new currency comes to the market, people will generate black money in order to meet the demand for black money. You're saying two very interesting things which I'm simplifying for audiences. Number one, they, they will have had very little impact on the stock of black money that existed before November the 8th. And secondly, because they've done nothing to take away the incentive to create black money, when there's sufficient currency in the market, new black money will be created. Because there will be demand for black money. There will be demand by doctors, lawyers who don't be give bills. There will be demand by traders who don't want to give bills. There will be demand by uh, candidates who contest elections. There will be demand by petty government officials who demand bribes. Therefore, that demand for black money, unless that is stamped out, People have to carry on their lives. They will generate black money to meet that demand. So nothing very much will have changed on December the 30th. As a result of demonetization, unless they take other measures. Absolutely. Let's now come to the adverse impact demonetization is likely to have on the economy. And to a very large extent, that depends upon how quickly and how comprehensively remonetization can take place. Now, recently, the Economic Affairs Secretary has said that by the end of December, 50% of the 15.4 that was demonetized will be back in the system. A few days later, the CEO of Niti Aayog said that by the end of January, that percentage could be just over 75%. If remonetization happens at that pace, what will be the impact of cash shortage? Or at one point of time, it was even cash starvation during the months of November, December, and January. Both are wrong. See, the initial remonetization used 2,000 rupee notes, which meant that for every 1,000 rupee note, if you replace it by a 2,000 rupee note, you require only half the number of notes. But then people have pointed out that the 2,000 rupee note is virtually unusable. Therefore, now they have switched over to a 500 rupee note. Now, for every 1,000 rupee note, if you're now going to print two 500 rupee notes, it will require twice the time to replace them and people are now demanding 100 rupee notes so i think both are wrong the initial they're both wrong in terms of the both wrong in terms said. of the timeline yeah. so i'm taking an average they demonetized 2400 crore discrete notes i'm saying note for note of the same denomination 100 uh, 500 for 500 and 1000 for 1000 as an average it will take them seven months because the printing capacity of all the four printing presses taken together is only 300 crore notes a month. So 2,400 crore notes or say about 80% of that has to be replaced. It will take them seven months to fully remonetize the economy. And if they In the meanwhile, the GDP would have grown. And if the cash to GDP ratio remains the same, 12%, the growing GDP will demand more currency.
So, in fact, the demand will carry on needing extra time to fulfill way beyond May. I can't see how the remonetization will be completed before, say, April or May, giving them the best uh, benefit of doubt, not before April or May. But if they flood the market with 2,000 rupee notes, Theoretically, they've remonetized the economy, but, that's valueless to but it's completely useless because people will still be starved of notes which are accepted and traded. Which means that Mr. Modi's much repeated promise that the pain will end on December the 30th, although now he's begun to say it will start easing off rather than end, but that will not prove to be true. It will continue till April at least, possibly May, possibly beyond. Absolutely. They have shifted the goalposts. Now they're shifting the milestones. December then one gentleman says January, one settlement says middle of February. I think they're simply shifting the milestones. They didn't do their calculation. The best way to uh, test what I, whether what I'm saying is correct or not is to make public the cabinet note. There was a cabinet note placed before the cabinet on the 8th of November. That should have some numbers. So let them place the cabinet note in the public domain. In which case, let's look at specific sectors of the economy to see how they'll be affected by demonetization. And let's start with the unofficial, unorganized sector, which is 45% of GDP, 80% of employment. Now, newspapers have had enormous descriptive reports about how there have been serious job losses, even serious slowing down in sectors like textiles, tiles, brassware, jute, beady, diamond cutting, grain trading. As a three-time former finance minister, how seriously do you think this vulnerable sector will be affected by demonetization? Many of them have been ruined. Many of them have simply been ruined for a whole year. See, in Tamil Nadu, most construction workers are from Bihar. Now, they want weekly wages in cash, which they send home, and they use it for their uh, daily life. Now, construction has come to a complete stop. Now, many of them are simply getting into trains and going back to Bihar. Now, they'll, they won't have jobs in Bihar either. They'll have to come back to Tamil Nadu. All that will take seven, eight months. And cost a lot of money. Absolutely. Which they don't have at the moment. And every major industrial hub, and you mentioned the industries, I'll mention the hubs, Tripur, Surat, Muradabad, Agra, every one of them is sh shut down. There's simply no activity there. So the unorganized sector will be very badly affected and within that, casual daily wage labor who only eat when they earn and if they don't earn then presumably they don't eat will be the worst affected. In Delhi, many of the head load workers, the guys who gather in the chowk every morning to be picked up for daily labor are going to the Gurdwara to eat in the langar. That's the only meal they can get today. So they're dependent upon someone else's munificence. Absolutely. Let's come to big industry and there at the moment we don't have a clear idea of what's happening but both the Business Standard and the Indian Express have said that the 43 largest companies of India in terms of the advance tax they paid in the third quarter of this year the total was just an increase of 10% on last year which analysts say is worryingly low. If you remove from that list of 43 the four oil marketing companies, the remaining 39, have only paid an increased advance tax of a paltry 3.7%. Side by side, we know that the PMI index for services for November has fallen precipitously by about 6%. What does all of that suggest to you? It shows that uh, the effect of demonetization is being felt even in the middle of the third quarter. It will be felt more in the fourth quarter because the production losses will be reflected in the fourth quarter as sales losses. In fact, specific companies have paid less advance tax this installment than they paid last year at the same time. And companies' names have been listed in some newspapers. And this is because of demonetization? Well, not immediately. What they're anticipating is by the end of the year, they'll have less profit. You see, advance tax is based on your uh, percentage of your anticipated net profit at the end of the year. So as a result of demonetization, they have calculated that the earlier net profit projection was exaggerated. They'll have to trim it. When they trim the net profit projection, the current installment also becomes less than last year. 
and this can continue possibly beyond the fourth quarter obviously this will go at least up to the second quarter of next financial year up to september next so the government faces the prospect of a slowing down in the increase of revenue from company tax i think they have already factored that they will lose a significant amount of revenue both in um, corporate tax and in excise what about agriculture the economics affairs secretary recently said that the rabi sowing was 8.5% more than last year but then last year was a drought year but apparently if you take the five year average this year sowing is only 0.2% below the five year average which is considered the norm do you accept the hint that perhaps agriculture is better protected from demonetization that it's not so badly affected no the, the area sown is only one measure let's assume that the area sown is the same as the five year average but have they used quality seeds or have they used locally available seeds have they used fertilizer and pesticide when it should be used or some have skipped the fertilizer and pesticide cycle have they hired labor at the correct time or has weeding and other activities taken place 15 days later i think these are uh, these are not tangible yet therefore productivity may be affected if some of these factors have come into play so while the acreage zone may be the same if you have used poor quality seeds if you have not used fertilizer if you have not hired labor to do the farm work at the appropriate time it may impact on productivity and of course side by side there's also the hit on the marketing and trading of perishables be it vegetables be it dairy be it other form of horticulture that too will presumably be suffering because mandis aren't operating properly well i've given a list in my column which appeared yesterday i've got prices as on november 8 and december 14 tomatoes potatoes peas cabbages cauliflower carrots brinjal spinach guava oranges garlic arhar have all suffered a crash in prices in the wholesale market now this farmer he suffered a huge loss of income and the government is not even hinting about compensating the farmer i was in nagpur oranges were being sold at about 35000 to 40000 per ton today oranges prices have crashed now if that is the plight of the farmer who is going to compensate him absolutely and the plight of the farmer will affect the rural countryside because the farmer doesn't earn he can't spend and if he can't spend rural demand goes down and then you have greater rural distress no well, fmcg companies have already reported a, a, a steep fall in the sales of fast moving consumer items in rural india in which case can we now make some assessment of what the hit on gdp will be this year i believe 13 agencies have made a prediction 11 of which have said it will be under 1% one has said 1% ambit went as high as 3.5 dr manmohan singh speaking in parliament said 2% but called it an underestimate as a three time former finance minister what's your sense of the hit on gdp well this is just a gut feeling uh, i think it will certainly be close to 1% i won't be surprised if it exceeds 1% so i would place my bet on about 1% of gdp and 1% of a gdp you know how much it is 1.51 lakh yes <laughs> 150 billion and 1% of that now against this mr jaitley says that not only will the government benefit from increased revenue because of increased taxes also a moment earlier you disputed that would happen but he also says the banks will be flushed with cash so they'll be able to lend at cheaper interest rates and he's held out the possibility or should i say the expectation that fairly near in the future he will be able to lower tax rates do you believe all of that is likely or does it critically depend on what happens to the economy what happens to growth what happens to jobs is this pie in the sky you can lend only if there is someone to borrow today after demonetization credit growth has fallen from a low of about 10% to an even lower level of about 6.6% if that is a credit growth which means nobody is willing to borrow today so what is the point of your saying i'm flush with money i'm ready to lend at a lower rate but unless there is somebody to borrow you know something some banks are declining to take fixed deposits 
because they'll have to pay interest and they can't actually earn because Correct. no one wants to borrow from them. Because if you take a fixed deposit, it's for a longer term, it's not a current, uh, current account, you have to pay a slightly higher rate of interest, which means you must have a borrower who's willing to pay for a larger sum of money for a longer period, a higher rate of interest. Bank declining to take fixed deposit is a completely new phenomenon in India in the last 20 years. In fact, the chairperson of the State Bank of India, Arundhati Bhattacharya, has actually said banks are going to suffer and she's asked for what she called a little bit of hand-holding. Yes. That is another problem the government has to face up to. Banks will be in trouble. Yes. You see, even if, you, even if this money has gone into savings accounts, you'll have to pay something like three and a half, four percent. And if you have no way to lend it, the bank is going to take a hit on its uh, bottom line. Now, side by side, and increasingly so, the Prime Minister has begun to sketch out a vision of a cashless digitalized economy. In fact, he's even gone so far as to say, not once but twice, that people should begin considering their mobile phones as their local bank branches. On the other hand, a former governor of the RBI, Bimal Jalan, told me, that this may be a great idea, but it's 50 years ahead of its time. Do you believe that India is ready to become a cashless digitalized economy? This is a big con game. There's no country in the world who just gone totally cashless. Now I have Bloomberg down. Australia payment methods 65% is by cash. Austria, a very advanced economy, 80% is by cash. Canada, 53% is by cash. France, 55% cash. Germany, which we hold as a model, 80% cash. Netherlands, 50% cash. In the US, the world's largest economy, 40, uh, close to 50% is by cash. Now, I'm questioning this whole theory that we will go to become a cashless digital economy in two or three years. This is complete rubbish. We can never become cashless. In fact, I would argue that we should never become cashless. A completely cashless economy means Big data is available to the government and they all become pawns in the hands of the government. And privacy ends. Absolutely, privacy ends. If, if a young adult woman buys lingerie, why should the government know that she's buying lingerie? Absolutely. But you know, speaking on Saturday in Bombay, the finance minister said that in fact commendable progress had been made towards becoming cashless and digitalized since November the 8th. But he added a section of parliament. And I presume he meant Congress and the rest of the opposition refused to recognize this commendable progress. No. Whether I should make a payment by cash or by digital mode is my right. I must be completely free to make that choice. Government cannot starve the economy or deprive the economy of cash and say you shall or you perforce you will be pushed to making it by a digital method. That is my right as an individual, and I'm going to argue that in forthcoming articles and interviews. It's my right to say, I want to pay for ground nuts in cash. I want to pay for my ice cream in cash. I want to pay for my popcorn in cash. But I want to pay for my motor car in digital payment. That's my right. I can understand if government says, for ensuring there's no tax evasion, high value transactions must be done in digital mode. I accept that. High value transactions. But who is the government to tell me that I should not buy a book by paying in cash, I should not buy ice cream by paying in cash? Who is the government to tell me that? What right is the government to invade upon my privacy? In other words, you can't be forced to have to use PTM and other such methods Absolutely. for buying your groceries. Absolutely. I, I go to a drugstore, I buy medicines. Why should anyone know what is my ailment and what medicines I'm taking? That's a matter of complete privacy. Cash. It's an invasion of privacy to say government will know or somebody will know what is your ailment and what are you buying medicines for. Cash protects privacy. Absolutely. Digitalization endangers it because the data can be leaked. But I'm quite willing to accept that high value transactions must be digital. Let's come 
to the manner in which the RBI as an institution has conducted itself with regard to demonetization since November the 8th. What's your feeling? It's failed. As bluntly as that? Absolutely. It's compromised its independence and integrity which it had acquired over years under different governors. I'm extremely disappointed that Mr. Urjit Patel did not handle this matter as any independent autonomous institution head should have handled. For example, he should not have been steamrolled into calling a board meeting of the RBI at 5.30 on the 8th of November and told to send the recommendation within an hour. I want to see the minutes of that RBI meeting. Why is the RBI unwilling to disclose those minutes? I want to know who attended the meeting, who, what was discussed there, was there any voices of dissent, what was the information placed before the RBI board. Equally, I want to know what are the numbers contained in the cabinet note that was placed before the cabinet at about 6.30 that evening. How can you have a command performance like this? 5.30 RBI board meets, 6.30 cabinet meets, awaiting the recommendation of the RBI. This is all pre-scripted. I can understand. There must be some coordination and some um, working together. But it can't be so pre-scripted in a decision of this moment. You're very disappointed with Urujit Patel's performance as RBI governor with connection to demonetization. I'm equally disappointed that he doesn't speak up. He's spoken exactly once in the last 40 days. And by the way, I must point out the three key players who should be key players in any uh, this decision of this nature have not spoken. One, the finance secretary has not spoken. The Secretary of Financial Services, who directly handles banking, has not spoken. And the Chief Economic Advisor, the top economic advisor to the government, has not uttered a word. What does their silence suggest? It shows that they are either dissenters or they are resentful of the manner in which this is being done. And in Urujit Patel's case, is his silence simply a reflection of not rising up to the challenge, not fulfilling his responsibilities? Because people look to the RBI for assurance, it hasn't given any. But the RBI can't, because the RBI knows that the printing capacity is only 300 crore notes a month. RBI knows that remonetization cannot take place in less than six or seven months. RBI knows that the ATMs have to be recalibrated, and that would have taken a month and a half. RBI knows that 500 rupee note is a note of common currency today in India, given the inflation over the last 20-25 years, yet RBI went along to demonetize 500 rupee note without being ready and prepared to remonetize the economy. I mean, it is an abject failure on the part of RBI if it did not bring all this to the notice of the government. So his silence, Urujit Patel's silence is a way of covering up for his lapses and mistakes and errors. Well, I won't be an individual, it's the fault of the RBI board. It's the fault of the RBI's uh, leadership, the governor and the deputy governors. Someone, someone in the RBI, I'm absolutely sure, sh would have spoken up. But I want to know whether anyone did and what did he say. Now, the finance minister of Bengal and the finance minister of Kerala have both said that after demonetization, the rollout of GST should be delayed. It cannot happen on the 1st of April. They say demonetization has already dealt what they call a whammy to the economy. GST will be a second whammy. The economy can't take both. Do you think they have a good point? Well, I don't think the rollout on 1st of April in the case of GST is possible. Uh, there is no consensus among the central government and the state finance minister. So it's anyway delayed? Anyway delayed, number one. Number two, the bills have not been passed. Parliament has to pass two bills, each state legislature has to pass one bill. The bills cannot be passed before April 1. Therefore, I think it is anyway delayed. Uh, but if for other reasons, uh, both the finance ministers of Kerala and Bengal uh, point out that you cannot roll it out on 1st of April, I think they are simply uh, taking advantage of the fact it will not be rolled out on the 1st of April. First, five days have passed since Rahul Gandhi made his dramatic claim that he had detailed information about the Prime Minister's personal corruption. He hasn't revealed any details to the country. He hasn't offered any proof. He's left this sort of democracy hanging over the sort of Prime Minister. Is it responsible, and maybe I should ask, is it moral for a man who wants one day to be Prime Minister himself to make this sort of allegation about the integrity of the highest office in the land 
and then not reveal the details? Well, I can't comment on that. Uh, we are discussing demonetization, whether what he had in mind has a link to demonetization, I don't know. But if it was an entirely different subject, I wouldn't know either. All that he said was that he would like to make the statement in Parliament, and Parliament is not allowing him to make a statement. Beyond that, I'm not in a position to offer any comment. But doesn't he have a duty to the country to reveal what he knows? Because if you say the Prime Minister is corrupt, the country has a keen interest in knowing what is the corruption, what are the details. And to leave the country in suspense is surely unfair to the country as well. Then I'm sure he's aware of his responsibility. One more question on that. It emerges from what these gentlemen have said to the Indian Express that important senior Congress MPs and former ministers Malik Arjun Kharge, the leader in the Lok Sabha, Gulam Nabi Azad, the leader in the Rajya Sabha, Anand Sharma, the deputy leader, say they have no idea what Rahul Gandhi is talking about. Kharge even went on record to say, I didn't ask, Rahul didn't tell me. Doesn't that suggest that he's had this alleged dynamite and he hasn't consulted his own senior party men what it amounts to, what is its significance, and he simply made an announcement on his own without taking their advice? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh I have not uh, had a chance to speak to him about that. I don't know whether others have had a chance. But I'm sure, as I said, having made a statement, he's aware of his responsibility. Was it a mistake to meet the Prime Minister 48 hours later to seek his help in quotations with regard to farmers? People say it was at least a contradiction, if not a mistake, because it seemed to let the pressure off the Prime Minister. No, no, I think the, I mean, I mean, the timing was perhaps uh, decided by the Prime Minister. I think he gave them an appointment. Clearly, as far as I'm able to put the pieces together, the opposition unity that was forged on demonetization is intact and there was no intent to break that unity. Except that the opposition unity suffered after that meeting no, with the Prime this Minister. This meeting was a request made earlier to present a memorandum based upon what they had collected from UP about a farm loan waiver. It just so happened that the appointment was given on the last day of this session, practically the last hour. So it did create, I think, some apprehension, but I think it's since been clarified to the opposition leaders that the unity among the 16 political parties on demonetization remains intact, and there was no intention at all in any way to slight uh, the opposition leaders or to exclude them. This was a completely independent exercise where the meeting happened on the last day. Suppose the meeting had happened on Saturday. This would be a non-event. Does it worry you that whenever Rahul Gandhi reveals what he knows, it may end up being a damp script? He's built up suspense so know. high. I don't want to comment on that without knowing what it is. The second issue I want to touch on very briefly is the appointment of the new army chief. It was announced late on Saturday evening. General Rawat has superseded two senior generals who were in line before him to be army chief. It's created enormous controversy. As someone who's been at the very top of government, what's your attitude response to this particular appointment? I mean, you come from an army background. I don't. You see, given how these appointments have been made over the last 40, 50 years, except that solitary case of General Vaidya. No, there are two others. In well, 88, know, S.K. Mehra became Air Chief Marshal overtaking M.M. Singh. And then in April 19, 2014, when you were in government, you appointed Admiral Dhawan overtaking the one who was senior to him. That's when the preceding Navy Chief chose to retire or resign early, accepting responsibility for the submarine disasters. Yeah, maybe there was a particular reason why he was superseded. Now, nobody has given a reason why the Eastern Commander, Eastern Army Commander, and the Southern Army Commander should be superseded. But what I gather is, given the nature of how these appointments have been made over the last 40, 50 years, barring one or two exceptions, these exceptions cause a lot of dislocation and disturbance in the Army's hierarchy. That's the impression I'm getting. I'm not justifying the exceptions nor do I say that this is unprecedented. Obviously, there are precedents. But I think the country has come to accept the fact that as far as possible, these exceptions should be avoided. Uh, stick to the 
seniority come competence unless you have a, a specific uh, ground to a, a supersede somebody. Now what I gather from the newspapers and media is no specific ground has been put against the Eastern Army Commander or the Southern Army Commander. The only ground that has been put out by some spokespersons is that General Rawat is more appropriate for the present uh, situation that we find on our border. For that very reason, I would say, if the situation on the border is a particularly difficult situation, if it is particularly tense, this is perhaps the time not to make an exception. This is perhaps the time to honor the well-established practice of choosing the senior most officer so that everybody will work together. Now imagine, I don't know, not that I wish to, suppose the Eastern Army commander and the Southern Army commander resign tomorrow. Will that not be a huge setback to the morale of the armies that they were commanding? And it's very possible they will because that's exactly what General Sinha did in 1983. Yes. Therefore, if the situation was particularly difficult, maybe all the more reason to stick to a time-honored tradition. In other words, the so-called explanation sources are giving for why this happened actually is a good reason yes. for not making it. That is precisely my argument. My very last question. You've seen a supersession in the army. It's created enormous controversy. At the moment, the new Chief Justice of India has not been appointed. The incumbent retires on the 3rd of January. Are you at all worried that Justice Kehar Singh, who presided over the NJAC case and turned it down, and therefore went against the government, might be superseded? Is there any such fear lurking at the back of your mind? I don't think the government will be so foolish, so stupid, as to supersede Justice Kehar. If they do, well, God save them. I don't think they'll be so stupid and so foolish. I think Justice Kehar will be the next Chief Justice. Mr. Chidambaram, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.